Welcome to Trial Site News Podcast Series. Today we have Dr. Heber from Calsa Medica joining us today. Now, Dr. Heber has 10 plus years of clinical development and product development experience in both the pharmaceutical and diagnostics industries. Now, privately held Calsa Medica is dedicated to the discovery and development of novel small molecule drugs for the treatment of autoimmune disorders, organ transplant, rejection, and other immune diseases. Founded in 2007, the San Diego-based company focuses on the discovery and development of crack channel inhibitor drugs. With the onset of the pandemic, the company registered studies targeting severe COVID-19 pneumonia, a dangerous condition. So, doctor, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. The pleasure is ours. Now, Dr. Heber, we want to thank you for taking the time to contribute to the Trial Site podcast. You have an incredibly impressive educational background. Could you share with Trial Site News where you grew up and what got you interested in going to medical school? Yeah, so I grew up uh, in Topeka, Kansas. My father, uh, when he came to the United States in 1969, we lived in New Jersey City, Detroit, but he settled in Topeka where he started his private practice. And that's where I consider my upbringing to be. And then I went to school in Baltimore and I became interested in going to medical school late in my college career. I really wasn't interested in it, but to me, as I got to, uh, I got familiar with uh, uh, the physiology of uh, a number of disease states that made me very interested. How do you how do things work and how do things fall apart is something that I became very interested in. And that's uh, what interests me going into medical school is, uh, is that. And in medical school, I learned very quickly that I was uh, born to be a nephrologist and I really enjoyed nephrology and critical care as a component of nephrology. So uh, it seemed to me that I found the calling that I had in life. Now, we know that in the mid to late 90s, you were a partner in the clinic having a nephrology practice. What was the inspiration in your life to move from the clinic to research? Yeah, what inspired me is that I felt like I had reached a plateau of knowledge acquisition and skill acquisition. So I wanted to expand further. And what really interested me was the idea, again, of How do you put a drug together and what makes drugs work and what makes drugs not work? And so that was the Uh rationale for me leaving my private practice and to go to research. I really wanted to understand uh, things on a a more fundamental level of the drugs that I was giving to my patients. Now, you've been in research for 13 years. Uh, Have you seen research change in the past decade or so? I think the fundamentals of research are still the same. I think what's interesting are the operational issues have changed quite a bit. The reliance on uh, uh, technology has actually been a very uh, welcome addition to clinical research. We're able to monitor patients throughout the world in real time these days, uh, uh, manage sites the similar way. So I think that's been a really uh, cool thing about the research uh, field is that the involvement of technology and the incorporation of technology has allowed better research to occur. Now, we also know that you worked for a few different biotech companies and then joined Calsa Medica. Um, what was it about this company that piqued your interest? I was brought to Calsa Medica by one of the board members to overview uh, the program. Uh, they were making a transition from going into from to, uh, targeting psoriasis as the indication to uh, treating acute pancreatitis. And given my critical care background, uh, he, he and I had worked together on a previous company, and he asked me to come in and take a look and uh, look at the target, look at the disease, and see if there was a good match. And what I learned very quickly is that the target uh, of crack channel inhibition was a beautiful match for acute pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis is a disease state that currently has no therapy, therapies at all. So treatment of a patient with acute pancreatitis in 2020 is no different than treatment in 1970. Patients come in, they get fluids, and they, you watch them and see if they get better. And there's not much else you do besides some pain relief. And so I felt like that this was a real potential to fundamentally change the practice of medicine. And that's what really excited me about Cosmetica. Now, the company positions itself as a market leader. From a research perspective, with calcium release-activated calcium channel inhibitor drugs, or 
crack. We know that crack channels are expressed on many cell types, such as lung endothelium uh, cells, but also immune system cells. Can you share with the trial site network what differentiates Calcimedica? And also, if you could talk about the potential of the science here. Yeah, so obviously, what differentiates us is that we persevered in this drug target space. There were a number of people back in 2007 who were looking at uh, crack channel inhibitors. Uh, most everybody uh, got out just because it was a difficult target uh, to develop a drug. Ken Starterman, who was uh, the founder of the company, one of the actual discoverers of this uh, crack channel, uh, kept at it. And we were able to create a drug that works. So I think that's number one. And then uh, uh, number two, Two, what's really exciting about this is this integration of the endothelium, the T cells, and the acer cells. Because in acute pancreatitis, all three are involved in the complications of the disease. So in the pancreas, the acer cell, along with the ductal cells and stellate cells, are overloaded by calcium through overactive crack channels. It causes destruction of those cells. Destruction of the mitochondria leads to pancreatic necrosis. In addition, that overactivity in the pancreas it creates an immune system storm. So these immune cells now become very active as well. And this too is mediated through crack channels. So the pancreas is involved and then the immune system is also involved. Well, what's the organ that you die when you have acute pancreatitis? Well, the organ that causes you to die when you have acute pancreatitis is actually the lung. So most patients who have acute pancreatitis, when they die, it's because of respiratory failure. So this combination of the lung endothelium, the immune cells, and the ASCAR cells is, for crack channels, it makes it the perfect drug target for acute pancreatitis. Now, let's switch gears then to Mm COVID-19, which is an awful situation. Uh, The company has pivoted to position at least one of its investigational products. Could you share your perspective on COVID? And especially when it comes to pneumonia and ARDS, what, if anything, are predicators to risk? Yeah, so COVID-19 obviously is a horrific disease that's caused a a disruption of of the healthcare systems throughout the world and people's lives. Uh, It's it's a disease in which uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and its attachment to the ACE2 uh, uh, receptor causes a whole host of of injury in the um, the body. And what happens is that patients who are have risk factors for having elevated ACE2 genes, like they're, they have elevated hypertension or they're obese or they're diabetic. Uh, they become at risk for developing uh, pneumonia. And it appears that the pneumonia is related to the immune cells in the uh, lung, in addition, uh, which include both T cells and macrophages, that there's this positive feedback loop where macrophages and T cells work together to create an alveolitis. That alveolitis also affects, uh, that inflammation also affects the lung endothelium, which causes that uh, vascular permeability to increase and further uh, injury to the lung from the movement of fluid from the End of the, uh, from the endovascular space into the alveolar space. So it's a, it's, this to me is uh, a disease which is very amenable to treatment of crack channels, and I can explain that as well. And my pathophysiological um, uh, understanding of the disease is like many others. It's changing rapidly over time. But uh, Richard Wonderlink and his group at Northwestern uh, is uh, – has done some really interesting work in which he's elucidated the mechanism of injury within the lung using BAL specimens or lung fluid specimens to look at the cells within the lung directly uh, in patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection. So that then leads us to COVID-19 and the positioning of your lead investigational product, Axora. You are conducting a phase two clinical trial targeting COVID-19. Can you share with trial site this multi-part phase two trial? Yeah, so uh, it's published on clinicaltrials.com. Uh, but we're taking patients who have uh, SARS-CoV-2 who are already hypoxic with a uh, definition, meeting definition for respiratory failure. Uh, so they uh, 
they have SARS, they have pneumonia, and they have respiratory failure. So these are the severe patients, and uh, they're needing oxygen therapy, either low-flow oxygen or high-flow oxygen, but not yet on the ventilator. And what we're doing is we're giving Oxora in the hope that we can prevent them from getting on the ventilator, hasten their recovery, and prevent them from dying. So when then would you expect sufficient data for a determination of safety, efficacy, and pharmacokinetic profile data? Yeah, we had initial data in the part one of the study. The FDA reviewed it. They suggested to us to change the study design to go from a safety trial to an efficacy trial, become a, to conduct a blinded placebo control trial. We had done an open label study because we were a novel uh, drug target of the IRBs, wanted uh, us to, uh, their investigators to actually have direct knowledge of whether they were giving drug or placebo when we first started the study. But now we've moved to a blinded RCT. Uh, that current study is currently kicking off and we should hopefully have data in the end of January or so. Excellent. Now, assuming that you have positive results, which we know is targeted for the spring of 2021, would you go to a phase three or try to accelerate approval? Uh, I think we would talk with the FDA. I mean, the FDA, I think, has been phenomenal to work with. They provided a great deal of good advice to us. So we would go to them and ask them, hey, well, where are, where do you need us to uh, to go to? Because I think if we did show that we reduced this composite endpoint of death or mechanical ventilation as significantly as we did in part one, I, I think uh, we would ask the FDA to consider an emergency use authorization. Now, as far as the company, what is the potential for the entire pipeline? We know that there are trials planned for acute pancreatitis with the company systemic inflammatory response syndrome, for example. Yeah, so we definitely are going to conduct our acute pancreatitis studies. Uh, We had actually, or had discussed with the FDA, uh, had designed a phase 2B uh, dose ranging study uh, to conduct an acute pancreatitis when the COVID pandemic uh, occurred. We had to put that on hold. And as mentioned, we transitioned to treating COVID-19 pneumonia. That study, we'd like to start up again later at the end of the year. We also believe Oxora, as mentioned, it affects immune cells and it affects directly the lung and endothelium. We believe that it is a target that should be developed for all forms of ARDS. So we will be looking into uh, the development of the drug for ARDS in general. Uh, there are also indications uh, such as acute kidney injury, acute ulcerative colitis, uh, where the drug may play a benefit. Our pipeline contains a number of other uh, compounds. Well, we're very interested in learning more about the ability of Oxora not only to treat acute pancreatitis, but chronic pancreatitis, which is a very debilitating disease for a number of people. We're also looking at uh, rheumatoid arthritis as another indication as well. Now, finally, before we let you go today, uh, how is the company's financial uh, situation? Trialside has a section called Investor Watch, and about 5% of our rapidly growing audience are, in fact, investors, many of them from prominent venture capital firms. Is there any message for the investment community that you would like to share? Yeah, so I would love to tell the investment community, we're a, we're a small company, we have tremendous potential for growth, and there's opportunities for investment. We're actually looking at putting together a syndicate to fund the company uh, further for these developments in general ARDS, acute pancreatitis, and other indications, as well as fund our, the remaining portions of our COVID-19 study. So, uh, you know, we would love to hear from investors who, uh, who believe in the strong science uh, in funding companies with strong science. Because we, I think that really differentiates us as a small biotech. We have really good science that backs our compound. We have published our results in COVID-19 in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, not many people have done that, but we've already, already taken the part one results and put it through the peer review process. It's published in critical care. So we're committed to the science and we have tremendous potential for treating a number of diseases in which there are no effective therapies currently. Well, Dr. Hebar, we are grateful for you taking the time to visit us here at Trial Site News. And we will certainly be keeping our eyes on Calcimedica moving forward and definitely hope to keep in touch with you. So right, thank I you again for joining us. Thank you very much for this time. I appreciate it. Pleasure is ours. Bye.